On August 4, 2015, the Mormon Church released photographs of one of Joseph Smith's seer stones, together with a leather pouch in which it was carried. Many Mormons were surprised to learn that their church was in possession of Joseph Smith's seer stone, and even more surprised when they admitted that it had been used to translate the entire Book of Mormon, rather than the Urim and Thummim, as Joseph Smith had officially claimed. Hi, I'm Dan Vogel. Use of this stone placed Joseph Smith outside the mainstream of Christian practice and placed him in a culture that mixed occult magic with Christianity. Within that culture, there were many who sincerely believed in seer stones, crystal balls, and divining rods, but there were also frauds and con men, especially if they were being paid or compensated in some way. Since Joseph Smith admitted he was paid for his services as a treasure seer, it is wise to approach his use of this stone with some skepticism. In this video, I will discuss how Joseph Smith got possession of this stone, how he used it, and how it came into possession of the LDS Church. According to Willard Chase, a carpenter and neighbor of the Smith family in Manchester, New York, the stone was found in 1822, while Joseph and his oldest brother Alvin were helping him dig a well on Chase's property. Willard said that he had been in the hole alone, digging about 20 feet below the surface, when he noticed a strange-looking stone that others would describe as dark brown and about the size of a hen's egg. When he came up out of the well, he showed the stone to Alvin and Joseph. We were examining it, Willard recalled, when Joseph put it into his hat and then his face into the top of his hat. On the following day, Chase said, Joseph came to him and asked if he could have the stone, claiming that he was able to see things in it. Chase said, I told him I did not wish to part with it on account of its being a curiosity, but would lend it. Willard's calling the stone a curiosity obscures his own belief in seer stones. In fact, his family was well known among Manchester treasure seekers. His younger sister, Sally, had a bluish-green seer stone, which she used to locate treasure and other objects, lost or stolen, and Willard sometimes dug for treasure at her direction. A skeptical neighbor, Lorenzo Sanders, whose sister married Willard, recalled that people, including himself, often called on Sally for help in locating lost objects, but said that she was usually of little assistance. Lorenzo's oldest brother, Orlando, once went to Sally to find some lost cattle, but when they were located, they were found right in the opposite direction from where she said they were. Gaining possession of a stone, declared genuine by a noted seer, was an important move in Smith's career. According to Chase, Smith kept the stone for two years, during which time he built a reputation as a gifted seer that would exceed Sally's. Testimony of neighbors locates Smith-inspired excavations in several hills on and to the east of their farm, as well as other places, and that Joseph Smith's practice included a form of ceremonial magic, such as the drawing of a magic circle on the ground around the supposed treasure the driving in of a stake in the center and twelve others around the periphery, and the utterance of a magic spell, which sometimes included animal sacrifice. This was all done in an effort, as it was believed, to prevent the treasure's guardian spirit from entering the circle and moving the treasure to another location. The earliest Smith family treasure quest probably occurred on their newly acquired Manchester land. In 1822, Joseph Smith Sr. told Peter Ingersoll, who lived immediately north of the Smith farm, that he could see treasures in a hill behind his house. Ingersoll was surprised when Joseph Sr. declared that a stone he picked up to throw at some birds was in fact a seer's stone. Taking the stone from him and placing it into his hat, Smith said, If you only knew the value there is back in my house, and pointing to a place near, there, exclaimed he, is one chest of gold and another of silver. The treasure behind the Smith's house 
was probably located on the small, narrow hill that runs along the eastern border of their property. In this photograph taken by George E. Anderson in 1907, the boys are sitting on the hill behind the Smith frame house, which is obscured by the trees in the background. William Stafford, an early acquaintance of the Smiths, who lived about a mile and a half south on Stafford Road, was invited by Joseph Smith Sr. to participate in a treasure dig that apparently occurred on this hill. According to Stafford's 1833 statement, Joseph Jr. had seen in his stone two or three kegs of gold and silver, located not many rods from his, Smith's, house. Despite Joseph Sr.'s leading the diggers through various folk magic exercises, they failed to unearth any treasure. Joseph Jr., whom Stafford said remained in the Smith's house during the operation, later explained that the treasure's guardian spirit had caused the money to sink, and Joseph Sr. declared that a mistake had been made in the performance of the magical rituals. While Stafford did not describe the exact location of the dig, he evidently intended the hill east of the Smith's home, since he introduced his account by saying that the Smiths believed that nearly all the hills in this part of New York were thrown up by human hands, and in them were large caves, which Joseph Jr. could see, by placing a stone of singular appearance in his hat, that he could see within the above-mentioned caves large gold bars and silver plates, that he could also discover the spirits in whose charge these treasures were, clothed in ancient dress. Another early Smith-inspired dig, related by William Stafford and supported in several sources, occurred on the hill farther east from the Smith home on the Chase farm. In this instance, Joseph Sr. and one of his sons approached Stafford, informed him that Joseph Jr. had located some very remarkable and valuable treasures, and requested the use of one of his black sheep for a blood sacrifice. Stafford, who was not present at the dig, said nothing about its location, but Palmyra Manchester residents later located it on Old Sharp, the second hill over from the Smith's farm and situated on the Chase family's property. According to this folk memory, Joseph Smith inspired another excavation on the eastern side of the next hill east. This hill, situated on the west side of the Canandaigua Road, just south of the township line, was also on Chase property. This satellite photo shows the location of the dig on the east side of the hill, discovered by Casey Kearns in the summer of 2014. In this photo, Kern stands in the hole, which is about 20 feet wide and 4 feet deep. Probably the most extensive Smith-inspired dig resulted in the excavation of a cave in a hill known to later Manchester residents as Miner's Hill, situated on the east side of the Canandaigua Road on land subsequently owned by Amos Miner and his heirs. The hill was photographed in 1907 by George E. Anderson. The man in the photo points to the approximate location of the cave, the entrance of which had caved in, leaving only a small depression in the ground near the top of the hill. Lorenzo Saunders was an eyewitness to the digging on the hill's northeast side, owing to the fact that his family occupied the land on which the hill was situated. I used to go there and see them work, he recalled in 1884. I seen old Joe Smith dig there day in and day out. Joseph Sr. told Saunders that Joe Jr. could see in his peepstone what there was in the cave, and that young Joe could see a man sitting on a gold chair. Old Joe said he was king, i.e., the man in the chair, king of one of the Indian tribes, who was shut up in there in the time of one of their big battles. After a tunnel of considerable length had been excavated, the diggers placed a heavy wooden door at the entrance and abandoned the project. Lorenzo remembered that the digging had occurred before his father Enoch died on the 10th of October, 1825, and that his father ordered him to tear down the door and collapse the entrance. The cave remained closed until April 1974, when Andrew H. Comer, then owner of the property, cleared the cave's opening with a bulldozer. This photograph, published in the Palmyra Courier Journal, on the 1st of May, 1974, shows Comer standing inside the cave. At that time, the cave was described as about six feet high at the highest point, in the middle, 
and 10 to 12 feet long, and carved into a rock-hard clay hillside. The walls and ceiling of the cave appeared to have been dug or picked by hand. Comer eventually closed the cave, and it looked like this when I visited the hill in 1992. In early September 2015, with permission of the owners, the cave was reopened by Casey Kearns and Greg Pavone. In the midst of these treasure quests, Joseph Smith was also claiming to have communion with the spirit in charge of some gold plates, buried in another hill about two miles further south on the Canandaigua Road, which became known as Gold Bible Hill, but is now called the Hill Camorra. At that time, the hill was on the property of Randall Robinson. Smith's involvement with the Robinson Hill began, according to his own account, on the night and early morning hours of the 21st and 22nd of September, 1823. Earlier that evening, according to what Martin Harris told Palmyra minister John A. Clark, Smith had acted as a seer for a local treasure-seeking expedition. It had been an especially favorable night for treasure hunting. The moon was full, and the evening marked the autumnal equinox. But as usual, the seekers returned home empty-handed. In later years, Smith claimed an angel had appeared to him and told him about the plates. But at the time, the personage seemed more like a treasure guardian, since traditionally angels have been viewed as special creations of God rather than the spirits of dead mortals. In his official history, which carefully concealed the folk magic elements of the original story, Smith said, While the angel was conversing with me about the plates, the vision was open to my mind that I could see the place where the plates were deposited, and that so clearly and distinctly that I knew the place again when I visited it. Originally, Smith said he located the plates with the seer stone. Martin Harris said, Joseph had a stone which was dug from the well of Mason Chase, 24 feet from the surface. It was by means of this stone he first discovered the plates. Palmyra resident Henry Harris asked Smith shortly after he obtained the plates how he found them. He replied that he had a revelation from God that told him they were hid in a certain hill, and he looked in his stone and saw them in the place of deposit. Chase said that during the fall of 1827, Smith confessed to him that if it had not been for that stone, which he acknowledged belonged to me, he would not have obtained the book. When Smith visited the hill on the next day, according to his own account, I made an attempt to take the plates out, but was forbidden by the messenger, and was again informed that the time for bringing them forth had not yet arrived, neither would it, until four years from that time. This conceals a version of the story he told his mother and others at the time, which was decidedly closer to treasure lore than what Smith was later willing to divulge to prospective converts. He originally claimed that when he attempted to remove the plates, he was thrown back by a supernatural force, and that the personage appeared and promised to give him the plates if he returned the following year with his older brother Alvin. Unfortunately, Alvin died in the interval, preventing Smith from obtaining the plates in 1824. Lucy Smith skipped over this uncomfortable subject in her history, but she remembered that he told his family he climbed to the hill's summit, pried up a large stone, and discovered the gold plates, encased in a stone box, just as the messenger had described. He said he lifted the plates from the box and set them down on the ground behind him, and then replaced the cover stone. When he turned around to retrieve the plates, they had vanished. Instantly, the messenger appeared and explained that he had not been diligent in obeying his instructions to not lay the plates down or put them for a moment out of his hands until he got into the house and deposited them in a chest or trunk, having a good lock and key. Smith was permitted to raise the large stone again to see that the plates had magically returned to their original location. When he reached down to pick them up, he was struck by an unseen power that knocked him to the ground. After recovering, he discovered that the messenger had disappeared and that the plates were again hidden. Chase's account is similar to Lucy's, but takes the story a step closer to folk magic tales about gnomes and treasure guardians. He remembered that Joseph Sr. told him in 1827 that 
Joseph again opened the box, and in it saw the book, and attempted to take it out, but was hindered. He saw in the box something like a toad, which soon assumed the appearance of a man, and struck him on the side of his head. Not being discouraged at trifles, he again stooped down and strove to take the book, when the spirit struck him again, and knocked him three or four rods, and hurt him prodigiously. Despite some variances in details, the story that Smith told was clearly one that dramatized the treasure seeker's expectations regarding gnomes and other treasure guardians who lurked just outside their magic circles. Chase mentioned another detail that is absent from Mother Smith's account. After recovering from his fright, Chase said, Joseph inquired why he could not obtain the plates, to which the spirit made reply, because you have not obeyed your orders. He then inquired when he could have them, and was answered thus, Come one year from this day, and bring with you your oldest brother, and you shall have them. Joseph Knight Sr., a Smith family friend from Colesville, who later converted to Mormonism, also mentioned the requirement to bring Alvin the following year. In the accounts that emanated from Joseph Smith in 1832, 1834-35, and 1838, there is a conscious effort to downplay the occult or folk magic context of the original story. He never mentions his use of a seer stone, and in none of his accounts were the plates removed from the box. Consequently, in these versions, he does not disobey orders by setting the plates on the ground nor do the plates seem enchanted when they disappear and magically reappear inside the box. In 1832, Smith said he went to the hill and straightway made three attempts to take the plates, but failing, he became exceedingly frightened. In Oliver Cowdery's account, written under Smith's guidance in 1835, Smith experienced three successive shocks, each more powerful than the previous. Aware of E.D. Howe's 1834 publication of affidavits from Smith's former New York neighbors, including Willard Chase, Cowdery admitted that Smith initially interpreted these shocks within a treasure-seeking context, stating that Smith had heard of the power of enchantment and a thousand like stories, which held the hidden treasures of the earth, and supposed that physical exertion and personal strength was only necessary to enable him to yet obtain the object of his wish, and therefore persisted in his attempt to get the plates. In his 1838 history, Smith reduced the event to, I made an attempt to take them out, but was forbidden by the messenger. Like his mother, Smith also failed to mention the requirement to bring Alvin. At the time and within the context of guardian spirits and enchanted treasures, it sounded very much like the tricks and other antics for which guardian spirits were well known. It provided a plausible reason for not obtaining the plates in 1824. In retrospect, as the story departed further from its folk magical origins, it became increasingly difficult to explain why God's messenger would not have foreseen Alvin's death. Following his failure to get the plates in 1824, Palmyra experienced a religious revival during which Smith's mother and older siblings joined the Presbyterian Church. According to his own account of the revival, which he moved back to 1820, he was partial to the Methodists, but couldn't bring himself to join. About this time, according to Chase, Smith returned the stone to him and may have repented of his money-digging deceptions. However, finding that his stories about treasure guardians were not well received by the Orthodox, it was not long before Smith sent his older brother Hiram to the Chase cabin for the purpose of borrowing the stone again. I believe sometime in 1825, Chase said, Hiram Smith came to me and wished to borrow the same stone, alleging that they wanted to accomplish some business of importance which could not very well be done without the aid of the stone. Shortly after obtaining the seer stone, Smith took a fellow treasure seer named Samuel Lawrence to the hill and pointed out the location of the gold plates. Fellow money digger Joseph Knight Sr. recalled that Samuel Lawrence was a seer and had been to the hill and knew about the things in the hill and was trying to obtain them. Verification of the plates in the Manchester Hill by two seers greatly excited the money diggers in the area, 
and about this time they began digging for them on the eastern slope of the hill. Lorenzo Saunders made an incidental reference to this excavation when he described his visit to the hill in 1827, only days after Joseph Smith claimed to have removed the plates. I went on the next Sunday following with five or six other ones, Saunders said, and we hunted the side hill by course and could find no place where the ground had been broke. There was a large hole where the money diggers had dug a year or two before, but no fresh dirt. According to Chase, Smith at first thought perhaps Lawrence might be Alvin's substitute. But not long after this, Joseph altered his mind and said Lawrence was not the right man, nor had he told him the right place. That digging had occurred on the hill later known as Camorra is testament to Joseph Smith's ability to instill confidence in others, despite no treasures ever being found. Of course, treasure seers and those who believed in such things could draw on folk magical belief in enchanted and slippery treasures to explain away failures. Regardless, Joseph Smith's reputation reached as far away as South Bainbridge in Shenango County, about 150 miles east of Manchester, where there lived a well-to-do farmer named Josiah Stoll, who, having heard about Smith's stone, visited Manchester about October 1825. The 55-year-old farmer had just spent the previous summer with other men in northeastern Pennsylvania, digging for a lost Spanish mine, which a seeress named Odell had located. Neither the mine nor its treasure were discovered, but the stubborn Presbyterian from New Hampshire refused to abandon the hunt, his faith in scrying remaining strong. Perhaps informed by a letter from his oldest son Simpson, who lived near the Smiths in Manchester, Stoll made the long journey to upstate New York, according to Lucy Smith, with the view of getting Joseph to assist him in digging for his silver mine, on account of having heard that he possessed certain keys by which he could discern things invisible to the natural eye. The young scryer was invited to Simpson's house, and he provided the old gentleman with a demonstration of his gift. According to Stoll's testimony at a subsequent trial, Smith looked into his stone and described Stoll's house and other things on his property. Stoll was impressed and hired Joseph on the spot. We cannot know exactly how Smith convinced Stoll of his ability to see objects more than a hundred miles away. A skeptic can only suggest that Smith may have used one of several possible methods employed by psychics, both in the past and present. In this instance, Smith may have merely exploited information that he obtained from a third party or by eavesdropping. According to John C. Bennett, who in the early 1840s occupied a place of importance in the Mormon church, the prophet used such a technique in Nauvoo. In his 1842 expose, Bennett claimed Smith convinced people that he was not far from omniscient by assembling information gathered from spies and informants. That Smith's meeting with the Stoles took place at Simpson's house implies that Joseph and Simpson were probably already acquainted. The younger Stoll may have at some point described his family's comfortable home, barn, and other outbuildings to someone in Palmyra or Manchester. Maybe a friend accompanied Simpson on a visit to South Bainbridge, and then unwittingly passed the information on to Smith. Or Smith may have overheard Josiah telling his son about various changes made to the farm. Whatever technique Smith used, it should be remembered that he was in control. He offered this demonstration, and he could have chosen anything to disclose. A true test would have been where Stoll requested specific information. Joseph and his father accompanied Stoll to South Bainbridge, gathered other diggers, and then traveled about 28 miles south along the Susquehanna River to Harmony, Pennsylvania. On the 1st of November, 1825, an Articles of Agreement was drawn up, stipulating how the 11 shareholders, which included Joseph and his father, would divide the treasure. On the first morning, Stoll led Joseph and the other diggers up the steep incline leading to the home of Joseph McCoon, Jr., situated atop one of the bluffs in the foothills of Oquago Mountain. As the group ascended the rocky slope, they could see evidence of Stoll's previous labors. Plainly visible from the path leading to the Mukun home was a large pit, 20 feet deep and 150 feet in circumference. Standing over the spot, Smith looked at the stone in his hat 
and corroborated Odell's assertions, declaring that the Spanish had indeed left behind about a ton of silver bars. After digging for some time, Smith informed Stoll that the treasure was charmed and had slid down the hill to another location. Over the next two weeks, the company would dig four additional holes, three smaller pits to the south and another directly east. As illustrated in Emily C. Blackman's 1873 History of Susquehanna County. This satellite photograph shows the approximate location of the diggings in relation to Isaac Hale's house and the house where Joseph and Emma would live when they returned to the area in December 1827. The pits are no longer visible. This is how the hillside looked when I visited it in 1992. In this photograph, taken by George E. Anderson in 1907, a man stands in what appears to be one of the smaller excavations, which Anderson labeled as the money hole. Anderson took another photograph looking down the hill towards the river and Joseph Smith's home. The boy and dog stand in front of the clump of bushes where the money hole is located. According to some accounts, Smith resorted to blood sacrifice in an attempt to break the charm that held the treasure, just as he had done on Old Sharp in Manchester. Michael Morse, Smith's brother-in-law, said that Smith told Stoll there must be a sacrifice of a man before the treasure could be obtained, and that finally he said that in lieu of a man, they could sacrifice a black slut that never had pups, and that when this sacrifice was made, they should drag the dead carcass around the diggings, and that would break the charm so they could get the said treasure. Smith, who concealed the major role he played in Stoll's venture when he wrote about it in 1838, was ambiguous about the circumstances leading to the disbandment of the company. After nearly a month without success in our undertaking, he said, finally I prevailed with the old gentleman to cease digging after it. According to Isaac Hale, young Smith gave the money diggers great encouragement at first. But when they had arrived in digging, to near the place where he had stated an immense treasure would be found, he said the enchantment was so powerful that he could not see. They then became discouraged and soon after dispersed. The changing disposition of the company's host, Isaac Hale, probably had much to do with Smith's wanting to disband. Hale, who had signed the agreement as a witness, was growing to dislike young Joseph. It was one thing to locate treasure through mineral rods and seer stones, but quite another to claim that the Spanish treasure was charmed and slipping through the earth. Smith's call for animal sacrifice was probably something Hale's Methodist sensibilities could not bear. He concluded Smith was nothing but a fraud. To make matters worse, it was also becoming clear that the young Smith had a romantic interest in his daughter, the attractive 21-year-old Emma so it was understandable that Hale had become anxious to see the company leave. For the next five months, Smith boarded at Stoll's home, attending school during the winter, and using his stone to locate hidden treasures in South Bainbridge and at several locations along the Susquehanna River. In his statement to Justice Albert Neely, Stoll described another incident that apparently took place in Windsor. Stoll said that Smith saw in his stone where a Mr. Bacon had buried money that he and prisoner Smith had been in search of it, that the prisoner said that it was on a certain root of a stump five feet from the surface of the earth, and with it would be found a tail feather, that said stole and prisoner thereupon commenced digging, found a tail feather, but the money was gone, that he supposed that the money moved down. While Stoll interpreted this as proof of Smith's gift, Justice Neely and other skeptics undoubtedly suspected that Smith had either planted the tail feather on a previous visit to the location, or more likely placed it in the hole during the process of digging, perhaps allowing Stoll to discover it himself. While Mormon apologists want to describe Joseph Smith's use of seer stones in the context of a widespread belief in folk magic and treasure seeking, they seem oblivious to the issue of charlatans and their methods. Indeed, Joseph Smith's method of operation was more like Ransford Rogers who in the late 18th century bilked money by pretending to locate treasure with a mineral rod near Morristown, New Jersey, in York County, Pennsylvania, and Exeter, New Hampshire, and was imprisoned as a result. A typical confidence scheme in Smith's time involved a transient 
who entered an area that was known for its tales of lost treasure, and where a charlatan's magical powers could be put to good advantage. Using a peepstone or mineral rod, he would lead the credulous to a remote spot where he had previously deposited a few coins and was able to impress them by pretending to find the coins. In the excitement, he would suggest that a company be established to hunt for the rumored treasure and that shares be sold in it. Thereupon, he would disappear with the money. It is likely that Smith built his reputation on smaller successes that could be easily faked, much like he did with the tail feather. One method was to steal something, like a cow, sheep, or tool, hide it somewhere, and then pretend to find it. This is exactly what some of Smith's neighbors accused him of doing. As early as 1831, South Bainbridge resident Abraham W. Benton, who was familiar with Smith's activities as a treasure seer in his area, reported, It is reported, and probably true, that he commenced his juggling by stealing and hiding property belonging to his neighbors. And when inquiry was made, he would look in his stone and tell where it was. Palmyra resident and Presbyterian minister Jesse Townsend reported in 1833, He has had a stone into which, when placed in a hat, he pretended to look and see chests of money buried in the earth. He was also a fortune teller, and he claimed to know where stolen goods went. Probably too well. Of course, this explanation was based on suspicion, not hard evidence. But still, it was the most likely explanation and preferable to the alternative of believing in the existence of enchanted treasures, guardian spirits, magic stones, and the efficacy of magic spells. On the other hand, believers had no way of protecting themselves from charlatans. Despite later attempts to minimize his early treasure-seeking, Smith's activities as a scryer were prolific. That is, until his arrest and court hearing in March 1826. Peter Bridgman, a nephew of Josiah Stoll, who believed that Smith was defrauding his uncle, issued a warrant accusing Smith of being a disorderly person and an imposter. While there was no specific law against being an imposter, the warrant's use of the term pointed to the specific section in the New York statute that described various kinds of offenses under the definition of disorderly persons. The section of the statute applicable to Bridgman's charge reads, All jugglers and all persons pretending to have skill in physiognomy, palmistry, or like crafty science or pretending to tell fortunes or to discover where lost goods may be found, shall be deemed and adjudged disorderly persons. The frequent use of the term pretended in the court record, even in testimonies of defense witnesses Josiah Stoll and Jonathan Thompson, indicates that Neely was examining Smith based on that section of the disorderly person's statute that dealt with scryers. In preparing a bill for his services during the 1826 term, Neely listed Peoples v. Joseph Smith, Jr., the glass looker, and charged the county $2.68. Smith countered that he was not pretending, but was a real seer, and his witnesses, Josiah Stoll and Jonathan Thompson, gave their reasons for believing that Smith possessed a genuine gift. However, because New York law did not distinguish between fraudulent and real scryers, the court would have treated Smith's defense as a confession of guilt. Indeed, the court record and associated bills indicate that Neely planned to bring Smith before a three-justice court of special sessions, although one was never held. This is clear from Constable Philip D. Zhang's bill, listing a charge for notifying two other justices for the forthcoming trial. His next charge is the most interesting. Ten miles travel with Mitimus to take him. This is Constable D. Zhang's charge for a second arrest. The most likely explanation for this entry is that Smith had absconded and left the county, probably to the home of Joseph Knight Sr. in Colesville, where he was arrested and returned to Neely. A probable explanation for why the contemplated Court of Special Sessions was not held in Smith's case is that Smith worked out an off-the-record agreement with Neely. Smith had good reason to negotiate, since it was becoming clear that his defense had no legal basis and that a formal trial would likely result in his conviction and possible imprisonment. Smith's youth, nine months short of his 21st birthday, may have inclined Neely towards leniency. Besides, 
Although he was unrepentant, Smith seemed willing to abandon his scrying career. Ultimately, conclusions about innocence or guilt are less enlightening than the descriptions from friendly witnesses of Smith's early method of operation as a seer. Clearly, Smith was not merely a partaker of the common folklore regarding enchanted treasures and guardian spirits. He was also a dispenser and benefactor of it. The trial marked a low point in Smith's life. He felt the sting of society's rejection. His unwillingness to discuss the event in later years indicates that he experienced a degree of shame. Through Oliver Cowdery in 1835, Smith asserted that he had been honorably acquitted, and in his official history, he failed to mention the episode at all. Smith would later tell followers that his early persecutions resulted from his vision of deity, but his severest persecution actually stemmed from his activities as a treasure seer in South Bainbridge. Despite his public humiliation, Smith had learned a great deal from his misfortune. His public ordeal convinced him that his career as a magician was too limiting. He would eventually abandon the pursuit of treasure scrying and take refuge in religion. Shortly after Joseph and his father returned to Manchester, Willard Chase visited the Smith residence and asked Joseph to return his stone, saying that a friend had requested to see the stone about which so much had been said. Chase was surprised by Smith's reaction. You cannot have it, he said. Chase reminded him that the stone was his, and that he had only loaned it to him. Smith turned to him, and with a malignant look on his face, according to Chase, said, I don't care who in the devil it belongs to, you shall not have it. Smith continued using the Chase stone in search of treasure through 1826, both in Manchester and in Colesville on the Joseph Knight Senior Farm, while he continued to court Emma. After Joseph and Emma were married, Stoll transported the newlyweds to Manchester, where they boarded with Joseph's parents in the frame house. Martin Harris and Lorenzo Saunders said that Joseph Jr. directed a treasure-digging company in Manchester until he received custody of the gold plates. The turning point for Smith evidently came in August 1827, when he, Emma, and Peter Ingersoll visited Harmony to retrieve some of Emma's furniture, clothes, and other belongings. Ingersoll remembered that Hale was gushing a flood of tears when he scolded Joseph. You have stolen my daughter, he said, and married her. I had much rather have followed her to her grave. You spend your time in digging for money, pretend to see in a stone, and thus try to deceive people. Isaac Hale reported that Joseph told him that he had given up what he called glass-looking, and that he expected to work hard for a living and was willing to do so. Hale responded, according to Ingersoll, by saying if Smith would move to Pennsylvania and work for a living, he would assist him in getting into business. Joseph and Emma accepted his offer, and arrangements were made for Emma's brother Alva to come to Manchester the following winter to help them move. Smith was no doubt sincere in promising to quit the money-digging business, but the break would not be easy. He told Ingersoll, on their return trip to Manchester, that he intended to keep the promise which he had made to his father-in-law. But it will be hard for me, for they will all oppose, as they want me to look in the stone for them to dig money. Smith's prediction proved true, for Ingersoll remembered that they urged him day after day to resume his old practice of looking in the stone. He seemed much perplexed as to the course he should pursue. On the 20th of September, 1827, Josiah Stoll and Joseph Knight stopped in Manchester to visit the Smiths on their way home from conducting business in Rochester. Martin Harris claimed that this visit included money digging. On the following night, Joseph and Emma went to the hill. When they returned in the morning, Joseph said he had taken the plates out of the hill and hid them in a hollow tree. Several days later, he brought the plates home, wrapped in his frock. On learning that Smith possessed the plates, his former colleagues in the money-digging business began immediately to plot how they could rob him of them and made several attempts. The money-diggers, Harris said, claimed they had as much right to the plates as Joseph had, as they were in company together. They claimed Joseph had been traitor and had appropriated to himself that which belonged to them. 
In the midst of such commotion, translating the plates was impossible. Soon Alva arrived, and Joseph and Emma slipped out of Manchester under the cover of a cold December night. In harmony, Joseph Smith dictated the largest portion of the Book of Mormon. From about February to June 1828, Smith produced about 116 pages of manuscript, which were subsequently lost by Martin Harris when he took them back to Palmyra to show his skeptical wife and other family members. Then, from early April 1829 to the end of May, Smith dictated to his new scribe Oliver Cowdery from the beginning of Mosiah to probably the end of the Book of Moroni. After being transported to Fayette, New York by David Whitmer in early June 1829, Smith dictated the lost beginning, from First Nephi to the words of Mormon, which was completed about the end of June. Contrary to what Smith later claimed about the spectacles, or Urim and Thummim, the manner in which he translated was the same as when he looked for treasures and lost objects. This is the method described by both Emma and Martin Harris, who were scribes for the first 116 pages. Describing her husband's method of dictation, Emma recalled, In writing for Joseph Smith, I frequently wrote day after day, often sitting at the table close by him, he sitting with his face buried in his hat, with the stone in it, and dictating hour after hour, with nothing between us. Following his 1870 interview with Harris, Edward Stevenson reported, He, Harris, also stated that the prophet translated a portion of the Book of Mormon with the seer stone in his possession. The stone was placed in a hat that was used for that purpose, and with the aid of the seer stone, the prophet would read sentence by sentence as Martin wrote. Harris also told Stevenson a story about the seer stone that he thought was proof of Smith's gift, but actually cast doubt on it. When they became weary, as it was continuing work to translate from the plates of gold, they would go down to the river and throw stones into the water for exercise. Martin, on one occasion, picked up a stone resembling the one with which they were translating and on resuming their work, Martin placed the false stone in the hat. He said that the prophet looked quietly for a long time, when he raised his head and said, Martin, what on earth is the matter? All is dark as Egypt. Martin smiled, and the seer discovered that the wrong stone was placed in the hat. When he asked Martin why he had done so, he replied, To stop the mouths of fools, who had declared that the prophet knew by heart all that he told him to write and did not see by the seer stone. When the true stone was placed in the hat, the translation was resumed as usual. Since it is doubtful that Harris could have found a stone by the river that was identical in shape, size, color, texture, and the distinctive circular stripes as Smith's stone, it is also doubtful that Smith was fooled. Smith had carried the stone with him on his person for six years and had spent countless hours staring at it, and would have quickly spotted the substitution. There can be little doubt, therefore, that Smith chose to play along with Harris's test in order to reinforce his scribe's belief that the stone had unique magical properties that enabled him to see the translation. Oliver Cowdery rarely spoke about his service as scribe, but when he did, he gave the false impression that the Book of Mormon was translated through the Spectacles, or Urim and Thummim. All the other eyewitnesses to the translation process, Martin Harris, Emma Smith, David Whitmer, and others, testify that the spectacles were not used while Cowdery served as scribe. Emma, who told Joseph Smith III in 1879 that Oliver Cowdery and your father wrote in the room where I was at work, specifically told Mrs. Pilgrim that the spectacles were not used after Harris lost the 116 pages. This means there was no alternating between seer stone and spectacles, as some apologists try to argue. The same is true for the remainder of the translation work that occurred at the Whitmer home in Fayette, New York, in June 1829. When Whitmer arrived in his two-horse wagon in Harmony to transport Smith and Cowdery back to his father's house in Fayette, he was surprised to be greeted on the road by the two men. Cowdery explained to Whitmer that Smith had seen him coming in his seer stone. In 1878, Whitmer recalled, Oliver told me that Joseph had told him when I started from home 
where I had stopped the first night, how I read the sign at the tavern, where I stopped the next night, and that I would be there that day before dinner. And this was why they had come out to meet me, all of which was exactly as Joseph had told Oliver, at which I was greatly astonished. Despite Whitmer's amazement, the situation presented Smith with a favorable opportunity to demonstrate his gift. Again, it is important to note that Smith volunteered the details of Whitmer's trip. It was not requested of him. It is probable that Smith simply exploited information he acquired from someone who had seen Whitmer along this major thoroughfare, which happened to come within feet of Smith's front door. In a slow-moving wagon, Whitmer would have been passed frequently by travelers on horseback on their way to Harmony or beyond, including the urban and port cities of New York and southern Pennsylvania. Those who observed Smith and Cowdery working at the Whitmer residence consistently described Smith with his head in his hat. In his 1887 pamphlet, An Address to All Believers in Christ, Whitmer declared, I am an eyewitness to the translation of the greater part of the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat and put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light, and in the darkness the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and on that appeared the writing. One character at a time would appear, and under it was the interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery, who was his principal scribe, and when it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear, and another character with the interpretation would appear. Thus, the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God, and not by any power of man. Whitmer repeated this testimony many times, and it was always the same. Of course, Whitmer and the other witnesses relied on Joseph Smith for their descriptions of how the stone worked. On one occasion, Whitmer said, In the darkness of the hat, a spiritual light would shine forth, and parchment would appear before Joseph, upon which was a line of characters from the plates, and under it, the translation in English, at least so Joseph said. Some Mormon apologists want to dismiss the idea that the stone worked in and of itself, but rather, they want to describe the seer stone as an aid in what was essentially a psychological process of translation, citing D&C 9 as evidence. In this revelation, Oliver Cowdery, who came to Smith as a rod worker and clairvoyant himself, is told the reason for his failed attempt at translation. Behold, you have not understood. You have supposed that I would give it unto you when you took no thought save it was to ask me. The revelation then explains what he should have done. You must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. Apologists believe that this is a description of how Joseph Smith translated. But this is incorrect. Rather, this describes how Oliver Cowdery could have translated without the stone. The eyewitnesses to the translation process say Smith told them he merely read the translation from the stone, and they observed him reading the words without long hesitations of working it out. When Harris lost the manuscript, and Smith feared he would be exposed by retranslating the same record, the revelation he received, now known as D&C 10, blamed possible different wording on those who would alter the text in an effort to destroy him. The implication was that if he did translate the same record again, the only differences would be in places where his enemies had changed the text, thus reinforcing belief in a mechanical and repeatable translation. When Harris exchanged the stone and Smith could not translate, it implied that the stone worked in and of itself and was not merely an aid to a psychological process. According to David Whitmer, after the translation of the Book of Mormon was finished, early in the spring of 1830, before April 6th. Joseph gave the stone to Oliver Cowdery and told me, as well as the rest, that he was through with it, and he did not use the stone more. Smith's brown seer stone was kept by Cowdery with the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon until his death in 1850. 
Shortly after, his widow, Elizabeth Ann Whitmer Cowdery, gave it to his brother-in-law, Phineas H. Young, who took it to Salt Lake City and eventually gave it to his younger brother, Brigham. Brigham Young displayed the stone on occasion, and after his death in 1877, it was purchased from his estate with another seer stone by Zina Deantha Huntington Young, a plural wife of Brigham, and she and her daughter, Zina Young Williams Card, then donated them to the church to be held perpetually by the president, who at that time was John Taylor. His successor, Wilfred Woodruff, mentioned the seer stone that Joseph found in a well, which he consecrated upon the altar of the Manti Temple on the 18th of May, 1888. After Woodruff's death in 1898, President Lorenzo Snow showed the stone to Bishop Frederick Kessler, who recorded in his diary on the 1st of February, 1899, that Snow showed me the seer stone that the prophet Joseph Smith had, by which he had done some of the translating of the Book of Mormon with. By this time, the stone had long since faded from Mormon memory, and relatively few people knew of its existence. Some Mormon apologists have tried to draw a sharp line between Joseph Smith the treasure seer and Joseph Smith the Mormon prophet. But, as we have traced the history of this stone, it has become abundantly clear that such a line cannot be drawn. In fact, when Joseph Smith began telling his story of the golden plates, he was also claiming to see in his stone enchanted and slippery treasures and their guardian spirits. Indeed, the story of the angel and the plates grew out of his role as a treasure seer. Joseph Smith's use of the same stone for both activities brings up the issue of why the stone did not work in finding treasure. If it failed for treasures, why believe it worked for translation? It is perhaps worth noting that Joseph Smith himself offered an apologetic for why he never obtained any treasures through his stone, except for the gold plates. This apologetic, oddly, is found in the Book of Mormon. At about 6 BCE, Samuel the Lamanite, perhaps a stand-in for Samuel Lawrence, is made to prophesy, Whoso shall hide up treasures in the earth shall find them again no more, because of the great curse of the land, save he be a righteous man, and shall hide it up unto the Lord. In other words, the gold plates were hid up unto the Lord, and the other treasures, Smith sought, were cursed. Samuel the Lamanite also predicted the lament of the wicked. Oh, that we had remembered the Lord our God in the day that he gave us our riches, and then they would not have become slippery, that we should lose them. Yea, we have hid up our treasures, and they have slipped away from us, because of the curse of the land. Rather than outgrowing or denying his former life as a treasure seer, Joseph Smith carried it over into his new religion. Have you ever watched a psychic and wondered why it's necessary for them to play a game of 20 questions? Why it's necessary for people to provide the details to the psychic's vague references? If you have, you're a skeptic. If you haven't, you just might be their next mark. A psychic requires the cooperation of his audience, the abandonment of skepticism, and the suspension of disbelief. To penetrate the illusion, to expose the fraud, one must first stop collaborating. Psychics have difficulty with skeptics because they won't participate in creating the illusion. They won't fill in the blanks, and they won't allow the psychic to control the situation. If the psychic is truly in contact with the dead or has psychic abilities, they should be able to answer any question you ask, but that's not what happens, is it? The same is true of Joseph Smith. If the stone really worked, he should have found at least one treasure. How about finding the stolen 116-page manuscript? In the preface to the first edition of the Book of Mormon, he said that he was unable to find the manuscript, notwithstanding my utmost exertions to recover it again. The stone should have led him right to it. He supposedly found Martin Harris's tie pin when he dropped it among the shavings on the ground, but was helpless when it mattered the most. He supposedly knew David Whitmer's movements on the road between Fayette and Harmony, but didn't know Joseph Knight Sr. wouldn't be home 
when he and Caldry unnecessarily traveled some thirty miles to ask for help. I have recently heard some Mormon intellectuals trying desperately to nuance Joseph Smith's use of the seer stone by comparing it to modern-day psychics and experiments in ESP. Obviously, Joseph Smith's claim to read the translation from the stone cannot be compared to the vague guessing games of the psychics or the slightly above-average scores of the Gansfield experiments. The seer stone didn't work correctly 31% of the time, and incorrectly 69% of the time. It either worked or it didn't. There was light and a translation, or all was darkness. I would say to the Mormon apologists that if you are unfamiliar with the methods of present-day psychics and con men in general, or haven't read the skeptical literature on these subjects, you probably shouldn't be commenting on similar phenomena in the past. In my opinion, a more honest apologetic would be to admit that the Book of Mormon is not a genuine history, that it is based on the mound builder myth and the Lost Ten Tribe theory of Indian origins current in Joseph Smith's day, that Joseph Smith perhaps felt inspired to write it, but that the seer stone and the book of plates were mere props designed to increase faith. I'm Dan Vogel. Thanks for watching.